The GPS, or Global Positioning System, is a system of satellites in space that uses cool and complex maths and the availability of a receiver to tell people where they exist on the planet, as well as the exact time at that location. And oh boy is this system useful. Our phones, from Android to Apple, and whatsoever other obscure brand phones you own, use GPS so that you can go to your favourite Chuck retail store. The airplane you use to fly in uses GPS to make sure you can go to South Korea and not North Korea. Want to know where your soldiers are when they invade a foreign country? Use GPS. And yet, this system is not truly global in that sense. It is owned by the glorious United States of America and operated by the United States Space Force. GPS is owned by a country? How could this happen? Very simply, the true technology we should be talking about, and very scarily we don't, is satellite positioning, which does the exact thing I explained in the beginning. How then did GPS become synonymous with satellite positioning? Why is such a powerful technology given to the entire world for free use? This is where the Cold War comes in. First, let's rewind back to the very beginning of GPS and the start of satellite positioning. It all began with, surprisingly or not, the Soviet Union's launch of Sputnik 1 on the 4th of October 1957, which was the first ever artificial satellite launched into space, which begins this whole fiasco. In 1957, the Cold War was ongoing, the Korean War was still at a stalemate, the Vietnam War had just begun, and the US and Soviet Union still wanted more drama. The breach of the next frontier, space, was just the trigger the US needed to fight the Soviet Union on another front. The aptly named Sputnik Crisis would occur, where the previously unknown ability for the Soviets to send things into space scared the pants off the US, and especially the army, since things can also include nukes. The very ability itself showed the technological gap between the US and Soviets, which was a humongous, gigantic, absolutely massive no-no for the US. Thus, to counter the fact, the space race would occur. The US would begin to pour billions of dollars into improving their space technology, and especially aiming to send living humans to the ne nearest natural satellite to Earth, the Moon. This race, however, will be put in the background, and these two people, William Guer and George Weffenbach would now be put into our limelight. After the Sputnik launch in the John Hopkins University's Applied Physics Laboratory, or APL, they started to monitor the transmissions from the satellite to learn more about this revolutionary technology. Within hours, the long-known Doppler effect would ring a loud bell in their minds, and they both realised that they were able to pinpoint the exact location of the satellites through only its transmissions. This revelation would be carried on to the director of the laboratory, and they would be given access to the UNIVAC-1, one of the more powerful computers they had at the time, for computation power to investigate more. If they could find the satellite's position, couldn't they find the position of the person tracking the satellite? This question wasn't just posed by Frank McClure, Deputy Director of the APL for Curiosity, but as with most things during the Cold War, was aiming to aim nukes better, specifically the Polaris missile planned to launch from a submarine, which required the Navy to track the submarine so they didn't lose an entire nuke. In addition, in the event of the need to launch nukes, a much shorter time would be needed to calculate and properly launch the nukes to their intended positions, since their location was very easily found in the deep, dark depths. In 1959, the project was now joined by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, led by Dr. Richard Kirshner, who would embark to answer the above question by developing a new system called the Transit System, which would be launched in September 1959. Unfortunately, the first satellite, Transit 1A, would fail to reach orbit. The second satellite, Transit 1B, was finally successful, and on April 13, 1960, the first step towards the satellite navigation system would be taken. Four more transit systems will be launched to increase the accuracy of the system and give relatively accurate readings every one hour or so. 
continued developments in the 1970s led to the ground-based Omega navigation system, which operated somewhat similarly, although more reliant on large transmitters similar to a radio. It's worth noting at this point that the entire world, or at the least the civilian population at large, was utterly ignorant of the fact that the US government had the almost magical ability to showcase a person's position at the snap of a finger. The very thought of removing the clumsy, confusing maps and slow, inaccurate radar systems was out of the picture. The transit system would have been good enough, if not for the ever-growing threat of mutually assured destruction into the 1960s. Funding continued to pour into this brand new navigation technology to better track launch positions of submarines carrying nukes, arguably the original reason why all of this was invented in the first place. It was also then thought that bombers could potentially make use of this technology too to drop their payloads with more accuracy, with the proposal of a mobile system for accurate ICBM control, or MOSIAC. The transit system was way too slow to handle the speed of aircraft and thus unsuitable for MOSIAC, so something had to be developed. But with the emergence of separate projects such as Timation, satellites aiming to provide accurate timings, SECOR, a system that uses ground signals to improve the precision of orbiting satellites, and finally Project 621B, which outlined essential concepts that would be required for MOSIAC. With this, researchers began to realize that they could combine all of these into one super-powered system, and thus the GPS was born. During the Labor Day weekend in 1973, a meeting of about 12 military officers at the Pentagon outlined the Defense Navigation Satellite System, or DNSS, later named NAVSTAR, and later again NAVSTAR GPS, as the need to clearly group satellites launched under the name NAVSTAR. From 1978 to 1985, 10 prototype satellites would be sent into space, and then the threat of the Cold War would catch up. The day is August 31st, 1983. It was going to be a normal day as businessmen catch their monthly flight to the now long peaceful Seoul in South Korea to transit to other places like Hong Kong and Singapore to do business. And families start boarding to take a trip to exotic Asia. The flight in question was Korean Airlines Flight 007 at 25 past midnight or 0425 UTC it would take off from John F. Kennedy International Airport, 35 minutes late. His sickening assassination, also a memory long past, just 20 years back. The current president was now Ronald Reagan. He would be bound for Gimpo International Airport in Gangseo District, Seoul. It would first go to Anchorage International Airport in Alaska to refuel, and then finally properly start heading to Seoul under the helm of Captain Chun Byung In and First Officer Son Dong Hui on 1300 UTC. KL-007 would enter the Romeo 20 airway, brushing 28.2 kilometers from the Soviet Siberian airspace, which of course was still in a strict rivalry against the US, and thus this was kind of a dangerous position to be in. Nonetheless, many aircraft flew this well-established airway, and there was nothing really to be worried about. The autopilot system is essential to every flight, at the time, it had four modes, heading, VOR slash LOC, ILS, and INS. A complex sequence of these modes would be required to be set in order to allow for the proper tracking of the aircraft's position and thus the autopilot would work. On this day, the Anchorage VOR beacon was inoperational. However, there was not of concern due to the ability to track their position at the next VOC beacon at Bethel. 557 kilometers away. Recall the civilian population still had no idea what GPS was or that it existed. Thus, the GPS system was not installed on any civilian airplane. The plan was to maintain the default heading of 220 degrees until it received the signals from Beto and thus engaged autopilot as per normal. However, this would require the strict use of the INS mode. However, 10 minutes after takeoff, KAL-007 would fly on a heading of 245 degrees, deviating north of Battle, and would fly on this heading for the next 5.5 hours. 
This was most likely due to the pilots not switching from heading to INS mode, and especially because the crew had no other way to check their position other than the VOC beacons which they missed. At 28 minutes after takeoff, civilian radar at Kanai Peninsula tracked KAL-007 9km north of where they should have been. However, with no way to communicate with them and no idea of their exact flight path anyway. 50 minutes after takeoff at Beto, a military radar would start tracking where KAL-007 was when it did not report to Beto as planned. However, delays to the signal would not allow them to warn the aircraft in time. Their diversions would also not allow them to transmit their position via KHF, so they requested KL-015, also en route to Seoul, to relay reports to air traffic control on its behalf. However, after three tries, no proper direct communications occurred. Eventually, they would enter the southern portion of the North American Aerospace Defense Command buffer zone, which is off-limits to civilian aircraft. It would deviate more and more northwards to 110 km off course, then 190 km, and finally 300 km, until it reached the Kamchatka Peninsula. This was also the period that the US and Soviet Union tensions had reached Cuban missile crisis levels, especially due to Ronald Reagan's aggressive moves towards the Soviet Union, which was also internally collapsing. His Strategic Defense Initiative, which was a proposed missile defense system, and Fleet X 83 1, the largest naval exercise held to date in the North Pacific. All of these threatened the Soviet Union and cautioned them of the true intentions behind these actions, putting them on high alert. At 1551 UTC, KAL 007 would enter the restricted airspace of the Kamchatka Peninsula, which was 200 km from Kamchatka's coast. The 100 km radius of the buffer zone nearest to Soviet territory had the additional designation of prohibited airspace. At 130 km, four MIG-23 fighters were scrambled to intercept the foreign aircraft. The aircraft should have been identified as a civilian aircraft two hours earlier. However, due to the false report that the key warning radar for Kamchatka Peninsula was fixed after weather-related damage, this could not occur. As summarized by Soviet Air Force Captain Alexandra Zuvyev, which defected to the West in 1989, he states, In the Kamchatka Peninsula, the key warning radar, radars, right. and uh, they were not operational. Moscow knew about this fact, and the, uh, Moscow made a big pressure on the local authorities to fix them. In other words, they, this would have been the radar that would have tracked Yes. Not just KAL-007, but all flights coming across that area? Yes. yes. And there was no yeah. operational no, radar? No operational radars. They reported to Moscow that they fixed those radars. So They lied to Moscow? Yeah, they lied to Moscow. But because of those radar problems, the Soviet pilot didn't catch up to the plane till it was leaving Soviet airspace. There was no time to identify it. And since the Soviet Far East Command didn't want Moscow to know that they hadn't been able to fix the radar, they couldn't let the intruder get away. They had to shoot KAL-007 down. Some people lied to Moscow, lied to Moscow trying to save their ass. The commander of the Soviet Far East District Air Defense Forces, General Valery Kamensky, would have an argument over how to deal with the plane with his subordinate, Anton Lee Komyukov, commander of Sokol Air Base. Both agreed to destroy it over neutral waters and obviously within the restricted airspace. However, Kamensky insisted on identifying it first, while Komyukov insisted to attack it since it had already intruded into their territory. Meanwhile, an hour had passed and it was now approximately 1451 UTC, and the fighters were still tracking the aircraft as it flew over Kamchatka, leaving Soviet airspace, now classified as a military target. It re-entered the airspace over Sakhalin Island. The fighters, now joined by three more Su-15 fighters, made visual contact. However, the pitch black night sky made it nearly impossible to confirm any concrete information. Firing shots were made by the lead Su-15 fighter. However, it fired armor-piercing shells, which were also nearly impossible to see. At the same time, KAL-007 contacted Tokyo Air Control Center, requesting clearance to ascend to a higher flight level so as to have greater fuel efficiency. This was granted. 
The climb led to the slowdown of the plane, which led the fighters to believe it was trying to evade them. The Soviets were very very scared of the plane, as they knew it was an American, only not sure of its intent. Their first reaction would be to assume it was either a spy plane, or worse still, a bomber. What massive controversy would follow based on the true knowledge of the fighter's visual assessment of the situation, it is generally agreed that the Soviets were at fault of what was about to follow. Yes, I'm approaching the target, I'm going in closer. The target's stroke light is blinking, we've already approached the target to a distance of about 2 kilometers. The target is at 10,000 meters. What instructions? The target is decreasing speed. I'm going around, I'm already moving in front of the Increase speed. 805. I've increased speed. Has the target increased speed? Yes? No, it's decreasing speed. 805, open fire on the target. It should have been earlier. How can I chase it? I'm already a beam of the target. Roger. If possible, take out a position for attack. Now I have to fall back a bit from the target. Jurassic Mako, cut the horse blade at the command post. What is that noise there? I repeat, the command task fire missiles fire on target 6065. We'll go. Comply and get Taraskov here. Take control of the MIG-23 from Simicur. Call sign 136. Call sign 136. He's behind the target at the moment. Destroy the target. Task received. Destroy target 6065 with missile fire. Accept control of fighter from Simic. Carry out the task. Destroy it. Oh, how long does it take for him to get into attack positions? Really getting out into neutral waters. Engage afterburner immediately. Bring in the MIG-23 as well. While you're wasting time, you'll fly right out! 805, try to destroy the target with cannons. Tokyo Radio, Korean Air 007, reaching level 350. I'm dropping back, now I will try a rocket. Roger. 12 kilometers to the target. I see both. 805, approach target and destroy target. Roger. I'm in lock on. 805, are you closing in on the target? I'm closing in on the target. I'm in lock on. The distance of target is 8 kilometers. Afterburner, afterburner, 805. I've already switched it on. Launch Z G. The aircraft will be reported to descend rapidly in spirals over Monuron Island for approximately 11 minutes before breaking apart in midair and crashing into the ocean. All 269 people on board were killed. The South Korean government would issue an announcement six hours after the attack that the plane had merely been forced to land abruptly by the Soviets. It is clearly seen that this sudden direct attack by the Soviets against the US and its West Aligned Allies was hurriedly covered up to prevent civilian outcry so as to allow the governments to slowly make their plans and to not be pressured to make decisions that could literally end the world as we know it today. As explained earlier, the global tensions would be sky high within the 1980s, and this incident would further escalate the tensions. Of course, nobody wanted to press the big red button. Careful moves would have to be made after this terrible incident. On September 5, 1983, President Reagan would openly condemn the shooting down of the airplane on US television. This would lead to massive public support for Reagan and against the Soviets, allowing for the deployment of Pershing 2 and cruise missiles in West Germany, which were 6 to 10 minutes striking distance from Moscow. Hello Americans, I'm coming before you tonight about the Korean airline massacre, the attack by the Soviet Union against 269 innocent men, women and children aboard an unarmed Korean passenger plane. This crime against humanity must never be forgotten, here or throughout the world. The Soviets still refuse to tell the truth. They have persistently refused to admit that their pilot fired on the Korean aircraft. Indeed, they've not even told their own people that a plane was shot down. They have spun a confused tale of tracking the plane by radar 
until it just mysteriously disappeared from their radar screens, that no one fired a shot of any kind. But then they coupled this with charges that it was a spy plane sent by us and that their planes fired tracer bullets past the plane as a warning that it was in Soviet airspace. They owe the world an apology and an offer to join the rest of the world in working out a system to protect against this ever happening again. Among the rest of us, there is one protective measure, an international radio wavelength on which pilots can communicate with planes of other nations if they are in trouble or lost. Our immediate challenge to this atrocity is to ensure that we make the skies safer and that we seek just compensation for the families of those who were killed. After this incident, President Ronald Reagan would issue a directive on September 16, 1983, stating that the GPS would be made available for civilian use, free of charge once completed, in order to avert similar navigational errors in the future. The only catch was that the signal was initially of 100 meter accuracy, meaning that the origin of the signal could be anywhere in a 100 meter radius of the showcasing position so as to ensure the Soviets would not misuse this technology. This limitation was called selective availability. However, over time, the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union would result in a policy signed by President Bill Clinton on May 1st, 2000 to turn off selective availability to provide the same accuracy to civilians as the military. As we can see, the GPS system we and so many other members of the community rely on so much today whether it be for flying a plane or for playing Pokemon Go, has been birthed from the Cold War in the context of the space race and then further moulded from Soviet-US tensions and the tragic death of 269 people, which can be somewhat admittingly said to have sacrificed themselves for the civilian use of this technology. This, this system that we take so for granted and the fact that we mostly forget about is that it is completely owned by the US government. Even to today, this technology showcases the lasting Cold War tensions that still exist today. The US can be somewhat considered to be the winners of the Cold War, emerging stronger from the ruins of the Soviet Union and the domination of capitalism even in those that claimed to be communists back in the Cold War. This obviously can be seen through their domination also of the skies and the GPS system. However, rivalries and mistrust still brew. Russia, China and South Korea regularly jam signals around their regions and are currently developing their own satellite systems such as GLONASS for Russia and Beidou for China. The Cold War was a tense, unforgiving and manipulative psychological war that negatively impacted many countries across the globe. However, we have to admit that from the war, we are now able to order grab food during quarantine and have it delivered mostly to the right address. And this all started with Sputnik 1.